We're so glad everyone's here. I hope that, how's everybody feeling after daylight savings time? I'm having my first like good daylight savings time because we don't sleep with a new baby at home. So I feel like this is like good life for me right now. Um, and I'm looking out and everyone looks tired and I'm like, oh man, there's a, we're just in that season all the time, right? So it kind of feels good. I feel like I'm like with my people now. Um, good morning guys. We're so glad you're here. Let's give everyone a chance to get settled. For those of you that are able, stand and we'll read the call to worship together. As we continue through this Lenten season, we pause for preparation and repentance in anticipation of Good Friday and Easter. Let us ready our hearts today as we remember Jesus' passion, celebrate his resurrection, and join in the ancient praise of all God's people in the words of Psalm 95. Read this aloud with me. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. And we are a people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll jump into worship. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for chilly mornings and sunny days. God, thank you for a place, a country where we can gather together um, publicly in a space like this. Thank you that we are a part of a people, a greater people and a people here in Durham. God, help us to quiet our hearts, settle our spirits. Help us to bring the tough things and lay them down at your cross today. God, you are good and you are faithful. You are worth trusting. God, thank you that you call us a people of your pasture. Thank you for being a shepherd to your sheep. God, teach us not to have hardened hearts. Help us to listen well. God, we love you so much. We are so grateful to be able to be here and worship with you. We pray that everything here this morning and this week would be for your glory, for our good and for your glory. God, we love you so much. Amen. Let us go to the Father through the Spirit by the sun as we sing.
we continue in worship, we take a moment to move into a time of confession. This is a time where we we recognize the Creator, that we have been made lovingly, but we have also rebelled against Him. We've sinned, we've turned away. We look to the cross, though, and we see love, we see grace. That's what this whole season of Lent is about. We look towards the cross, and we acknowledge why it had to happen. So we're going to join together and, uh, and say a prayer of confession to the Lord as one. Um, so join me in this prayer. Lord, we have denied you refusing to know you. We have betrayed you by keeping our distance. We have mocked you by pretending we are not yours. Lord, we are lost. Let your forgiveness find us. Welcome us into your strong, forgiving arms, and let us feel reconciled once again.
When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. everybody, welcome to Vintage Church Durham. My name is Sean and I'm a pastor here. I'm so grateful that you have woken up this morning. Uh, earlier, at least it feels than normal. Uh, you've joined in the arbitrary changing of times and made it to church here. And if you forgot and woke up and said, thank goodness it's on Facebook, welcome to you. As well, we're glad that you're joining us in worship this morning. Um, I have a few announcements before we dive into the text. Uh, the first is that if you are new or new-ish to Vintage, we are so grateful that you're here and worshiping with us. Uh, we have in the chairs in front of you Connect cards. Uh, you also may have received one at the welcome table when you came in. We'd love for you to fill it out, uh, either Phil or myself, most likely Phil, but one of the two of us will get in contact with you. We'd just love to, to grab you a cup of coffee or lunch and get to know you a little bit better, uh, answer any questions you have, and, and just thank you for coming to worship Jesus with us. Uh, additionally, um, this Saturday... And, and so we say this each time, this is the third one now, uh, and each, each month we have a discipleship intensive 
Uh, it's uh, about two hours. This one's going to go two and a half hours. Uh, and it's a time where we do a deep dive into some aspect of what it is to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. And, and each week we're like, if you want to come, RSVP and, and, and let us know. And usually like Friday night. Everyone who's coming, RSVPs. If you're like I do it earlier, just like I say to my kids, then I'm not talking to you. Um, but if you are interested in coming, especially this month, we'd love for you to RSVP. Uh, Christy Anyabwile is coming from uh, D.C. down. She just wrote a book, literarily, uh, on how it is that we read the scriptures. Uh, and so if you, if you kind of struggle with what do I get out of the scriptures? How do I approach it? Uh, the book literarily, uh, I'm, I'm like three quarters of the way through because it literally just came out like a week and a half ago. Um, but it's so far, it's just so good and helpful and approachable. And I love Christy and she's going to be leading our discipleship intensive this Saturday. Uh, and then her husband, Thabiti, is going to be here and he'll be preaching for us next Sunday. So I'm really excited to have the Anya Builes down from D.C. to do that. But please uh, RSVP to that. And the reason I say that is because we have copies and we can get more, but we're going to put a copy in your hand uh, when you come. And so we want to know and make sure we have the right amount. Um, so if you would, RSVP, uh, the book will be our gift to you. We, we just love to see you there this Saturday. Uh, also, in, in the back, there's sort of an information table with a bunch of sheets. Uh, because I typically forget things up here, and also because we don't want to spend 45 minutes going through all the things we're doing, we have event, uh, event cards back there. You can grab one. They cover uh, through April. So you can just stick it up on your fridge. If, you're, if you are a Luddite like me and you like a hard copy of something in your hand, uh, then, then go ahead and grab that. Um, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to jump into this morning's text. Jesus, thank you so much for your love for us. You're so gracious and kind. You've given us yourself. You've revealed who you are and how you love us and who we are to be in your word. You've given us your saints so that we can gather together and worship you. We love you. Meet us this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, real quick. Megan, are the lights on? Because it feels super dark. Can you just flip those switches? Sorry, like, right? We, we all had to wake up an hour earlier, so it'd be good if we could. Do we got them? Are we getting them? Yes, yes. Sorry, that's just for me, y'all. Well-oiled machine here. Great, awesome. So, uh, <laughs> If you're new, Vintage is a church where doubters, seekers, and followers can learn what it is to follow Jesus together. This year thus far, we've been doing that in the Gospel of Matthew, and it's actually a really good place to do that because Matthew sort of begins Jesus' ministry with him calling some people out of the lives that they were in and saying, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Jesus begins to call disciples, and when he says men there, it means all people, but Jesus begins to call disciples, and, and these, these four guys hop out of their boats, they're fishermen, and so that saying makes a little more sense, and they start following Jesus, and then eventually it's 12, and then it's men and women across the region just continue following Jesus and learning what it is to follow Jesus. And, and they were, as we say each week, they, they fit in those categories. Many of them were doubters. Like they didn't really believe what Jesus was doing and they didn't really know who Jesus was, but they kind of were there because it was kind of a good show. Like Jesus did a lot of cool stuff. And, and so he had this following that would come because they were like, is he going to do something cool today? Right? But then there were people who were actually seeking after him. People you wouldn't expect. People from every strata in society. People with histories 
that weren't typically welcomed by the religious elite, the religious communities of the day. All kinds of people who were seeking after him. And some even believed, though their belief would waver back and forth. And so as we've been walking through what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom of God, really what we've been walking through is what does it look like to follow Jesus? And in order to follow Jesus, we have to know who he is and what he's come to do. And the overwhelming thrust of Matthew is that Jesus Jesus is the promised Messiah and King, the son of David the one who is coming to redeem his people and to redeem all things. Jesus has come to bring the fullness of shalom, the wholeness of God to earth as it is in heaven. Heaven on earth. That's what Jesus has come to do, and that's what Jesus is calling his followers into. So as followers of Jesus, we follow him into this. And as we've seen over the last couple weeks now, Jesus has entered into Jerusalem now, and he is on his way to the cross. He's made it very clear through his actions, through riding in, through choosing to ride in on a donkey with a colt, that, that he is the promised Messiah. The people cried out on on what we call Palm Sunday. They cried out, Hosanna, save us to the son of David, the promised king. They were using prophetic language to describe who Jesus was. And when the religious leaders in the temple saw this, they said to Jesus, listen, the children are calling you the son of David. And Jesus doesn't correct them. Jesus, in fact, receives it as truth. And so from here on out, what we see is Jesus being tested, Jesus being uh, uh, argued with, Jesus being, there's this attempt to try and, and, and trip Jesus up. And so we come to this text. In this text, we find at the end of the chapter, it's a little like, I get this is going to be weird. Next week, we're actually doing something that happens before this. In the text, but, but this week we find ourselves in Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40. And it starts and it says, But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. And so Jesus is getting the Sadducees and the Pharisees, uh, and they're each coming at him trying to test them. If you are unfamiliar with those terms or with those groups of of religious leaders, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, uh, I'm going to say it this way and know that this is a super oversimplification, um, but suffice to say it's what we're going to use. Right? If you can imagine, the Sadducees were sort of the uh, liberal progressives, theologically. We're not talking about their politics. We're not talking about their social standing. We're talking about theologically. Their approach to scripture, they didn't believe in a bodily resurrection, for example. Uh, they hyper-spiritualized much of the scriptures. And so as a result, they have a perspective of what it means to be Jewish and how to be Jewish in Second Temple Judaism in the first century in Israel. And so just before this, this group of people who don't believe in the resurrection come to Jesus and say, uh, Teacher, Moses says, if a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers among us. Verse 25. The first married and died having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. So too the second and third down to the seventh. All right, so you're getting the scenario. A brother marries a woman. They don't have kids. He dies. Now, according to the law, it is the brotherly obligation of the next in line to marry that woman and have a child. That child won't be his, technically. It will be the older brothers. This is weird, but there's actually a really important story in the Old Testament that has to deal with this. Uh, but, But that's another 
story. So, now the scenario keeps going. The second brother doesn't have a kid. He dies. All right, the responsibility now moves to the third brother. And then the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. Six brothers die in this scenario. And here is what the Sadducees' concern is. After the resurrection, whose wife will she be? All right. So, first of all, this is a fantastic exercise in missing the point completely. (laughs) And sometimes, I feel like we do this. We have these remarkable scenarios wherein we think we're proving someone to be foolish. But in the midst of it, we are completely missing the point of what God came to do and of what God has called us to be to one another. Like they are testing Jesus. But do you hear that scenario? Seven brothers. Each of them marries this woman in life in obedience. Who's the wife? Who, who's her husband in, in, in the forever after? In the resurrection. Why is this such to them a compelling argument? Because they believe the resurrection is foolish. They believe that this notion of resurrection actually creates more problems than it, than it supposes to solve. And they believe that resurrection is primarily a spiritual reality that we live in right now. And so Jesus says to them, <laughs> I love, you are wrong. <laughs> Because you neither know the scriptures nor the power of God. You've missed the point. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished by his teachings. Listen, we're not going to go into that because that's not our text. Suffice it to say, what Jesus is saying is all of this is leading toward resurrection. Because all of this right here and right now, is bridled and broken and cursed with death. And God is not the God of the dead, but of life, which means that resurrection is the sign and the action in which God demonstrates his power over sin and death and the curse and brokenness. This is where it's all headed. Life, new life, eternal life, forevermore. You're squabbling about this weird junk. When I'm trying to tell you that everything that's broken is going to be made new. This is where it's headed. And this is super important. And the reason that, I, that I'm starting here instead of just jumping into the text that we're in is because the way that Matthew writes the story is that like the, the Sadducees were on one side, the Pharisees were on the other, and they were just taking turns grilling Jesus. For some reason, this group and this group that do not like each other have, have got it in their heads that the person we actually need to take down is Jesus. And it's remarkable that the way Jesus lived was so revolutionary that even groups that were opposed to each other were like, this is a problem. This is a threat to our power. We have to address it and take it down. And so the, 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 the Sadducees come through and everybody's astonished because Jesus says the resurrection is about the power of God over death and the new life that is to come forever. And so the Pharisees come and hearing that he silenced the Sadducees, they gather together and one of them, a lawyer, asks him a question to test him. A lawyer is important because he's an expert on the law. He knows all the ins and outs, the loopholes, the ways around it. He has devoted his life to studying the Mosaic law. He is not just sort of a, a general lawyer of, of the empire who would, who would uh, <clears throat> represent somebody in, in case Rome tried to do something funky. Right? He was a Pharisee and a lawyer, one who was an expert in the law. And he asked Jesus an actually really familiar question of the day, right? This isn't a seven 
brides for some brothers or whatever just happened. Teacher, which is the great commandment? Which is the great commandment? We need to hear what's behind this. Because the question of what the great commandment is to a people who are God's covenant people is, is, more, uh, is deeper than just the question of what's the thing that God wants us to do most. This isn't sort of just a hierarchy of ethics question. You know, because sometimes the laws come up against each other and we have to make choices. And sometimes those choices, they don't look like what would normally be the moral action. For example, lying. And yet Rahab does it and Rahab is commended by God. So how do we distinguish between this hierarchy of ethics? It's not what Jesus is being asked here. These are a people who believe in the resurrection. These are a people who believe in the new life and the new way to come. And they have a way of understanding that, a, a mode through which they understand that, and that is called covenant. God has covenanted with his people. God has redeemed them and, and separated them out from Egypt. He's, he's drawn them out of slavery and he has saved them. He's told his people to follow him into new life and into a new land, the promised land, flowing with milk and honey. And on the way, he covenants with them. I'm your God, you're my people. Moses, we're going to come to the table later. Moses pours out blood and, and establishes for them the covenant. He pours out the blood of the covenant. And with the covenant comes the law. Covenant and law are tied together because if God's covenant means that they're God's people and he is their king, then God's way of living, the law. God's culture for his people, the law. God's expectations for them. What distinguished God's people from all of the other people in the land? God laid all of that out for them in the law, 618 different laws, I believe it is. If I'm wrong and you like Wikipedia that, don't yell it out. I'm, I'm just wrong. It's a bunch is the point of laws that are meant to govern the way that God's people live in the midst of other nations to demonstrate their culture as God's people. Now, that's not the only reason for the law. We'll find out that the law was meant to bind them up and to, to show us that we cannot achieve the holiness that God has for us and calls us to be dependent on Christ. We'll see the law, uh, it's called a, a doula, which was, uh, in, in this particular case, a, a, a slave in the Roman Empire that a family would have who would watch over the kids until they were ready to inherit the fullness of their, their uh, father's uh, wealth and their, their, their adulthood, right? But here, the law, this is a cultural question. What is the culture of the kingdom? If you're the promised king, if you're the Messiah, what is the culture of the kingdom? Is it Sabbath rest? Is that what distinguishes your people? Is it the way they honor their mother and their father? Is it the foods that they eat and don't eat? What is it? What distinguishes the culture of the kingdom? And Jesus says this. He quotes from two separate passages, and he ties them together. This is not unusual as an answer. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with everything you have. Listen, we could spend time talking about the different ways that he talks the heart and the soul and the mind and and how that affects us, but, but it is enough simply to say, Jesus is not saying you can divorce these things, but rather, this is the whole person, and with your whole person, you are to love the Lord your God. Love God and love neighbor. 
He comes next. He says, the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, this would not have been a terribly unusual answer. In fact, this may have been the right answer, and you would hear it phrased like this. The great commandment is love God and love neighbor. We say that all the time. So did they. Jesus does a couple things, though, that are different and remarkable here. The first is that he ties them together as almost being the same thing. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But in the middle, he says, the second is likened unto it. That phrase in the Greek means cut from the same cloth. What Jesus is saying is you love the Lord your God with all that you are by loving your neighbor as yourself. And you cannot love your neighbor as yourself if you do not love God with all that you have. He ties them together. And then he says, on these rest all the law and the prophets. What Jesus is saying here is remarkable. The love of God necessarily moves you into love of neighbor. There is no question. There is no way around it. It, All of those other things, too, that you might want to argue about hierarchy, they all fall into place when you do these first two things. In essence... All of the laws that God gives God's people and all of the prophetic word that we hear from God and the prophets, all of scripture as they have it can be summed up in God compelling God's people to love him and in doing so to love everyone else. Love is the culture of the kingdom. If you want to enter into Life, if you want to walk as a citizen of the kingdom of God, if you want to know what ought to set apart followers of Jesus, it's that our culture is primarily defined by love. This isn't to say that no one else loves or knows how to love. But think about the cultures in that day. What might the Pharisees have said the primary central reality of their culture was? I think it would have been something like faithfulness to the law, faithfulness to Torah. How many of you grew up in church and religious cultures where you would say that was the culture? What is the central defining culture of this church community? And the answer, whether they would say it out loud or not, in action, and indeed, the answer was obedience to commandments. Or, the answer was doctrinal fidelity. We are building the whole of our church community around these doctrinal points, around this doctrinal community and fidelity to that is the central and defining characteristic of this community. We may not be loving, but we're obedient. We may not be loving, but our theology is right. It's a little bit of a problem there, and I hope you see it emerging. If obedience can be achieved without love, then the obedience is not to the great commandment. And if your theological system, though it may be technically orthodox and technically in line with scriptural verses and passages, and though each of the things that its, its propositions may be technically true, If it does not lead you to love, it is not the ethos or the culture of the kingdom of God. Love. Jesus could have said a lot here, and he chose love. It is the culture of the kingdom. It is the defining reality of the kingdom. 
In the kingdoms of the world, what might some of those things be? We see a lot of those things, money, profit. Here's what's amazing. When you read the scriptures, the currency of the kingdom is love. Owe nothing to anyone but love. We are indebted to one another with love. You owe one another love. Now, I'm not going to sit here and parse out exactly what that's going to look like because there are so many complicating factors and situations in which it is hard to demonstrate exactly what does it mean or what does it look like for you to love. But if your central and guiding principle is love and you walk in it, you will keep the commandments. The culture of the kingdom is love. Time and time again. We see Jesus saying, do you want them to know that you belong to me? Love one another. This is my commandment, that you love one another, that your joy may be full. The citizens of God's church and God's kingdom are meant to be lovers of all people. Are we marked by a deep and abiding love? Let's start with for one another. I want to think about that in the context of the church for a bit. In the church, in our church, are we marked by a deep and abiding love for one another? Do we look like the, 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 the call that we see from Paul to the church in Philippi in chapter 2 when it says, have this mind in you that's also in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, thinking not of yourself is the greatest, but looking towards the needs of the others as primary and humbling yourself. Looking not out for your own self-interest, but for the interests of others. Do we do that? Right? We've been so excited about the needs ministry. And we're so grateful that we've got, got Melanie who's leading that and, and, and all of the, the good. But it's not just because we can see a need and meet it, though we want to do that. It's because seeing needs and meeting it is a deeper demonstration of love. We love one another. Loving one another in the church community means protecting the vulnerable in the church community. We have a lot of rules about who can serve our children, right? This isn't uh, because we want to avoid a lawsuit. This is because we love our children. And we will do everything, and I mean everything we can, to protect them. The broken, the vulnerable... Love doesn't abuse power. Love uses power to care for and to protect, particularly the vulnerable. Love welcomes in. Right? If we are a community that loves one another, this becomes a beacon to the world that in this place you will find love. Love moves towards tension. Doesn't hold a grudge. Doesn't mean you don't get mad. Doesn't mean that sometimes you're like, that guy is a knucklehead. It means that guy is a knucklehead and I'm going to move towards him in love. It means I wronged you. I'm going to move towards you in repentance and love. Love is vulnerable. Love is humble. Is that how our community is marked? Is that the culture of vintage church and a vintage church journey? If not, then we need to do the hard work of uprooting any unloving culture within us and laying down foundations of love for one another. But that Christian culture of love doesn't just stay within, right? That Christian culture of love, it expands out. Our love pushes out into our community, to our neighbors, the people we work with, our family and friends, the people that that we hang out with, 
we love and demonstrate love to them. The scriptures call us to justice. We don't do justice because it's in vogue. We don't do justice because we're, we're trying to bring about a, 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 a better politic. We don't do justice in order to gain power and prestige and prominence as the doers of justice. We do justice because love requires it of us. Love requires us to see the broken and to move towards it with the shalom, the wholeness of God. Love requires us to see need and to move towards it with the prodigal giving and generosity of God. Love requires us to see an equity and to speak to it and to say this is not how it should be. We will not have it. Love requires us to do justice, to be merciful, to walk humble. The love of God compels us to our neighbors. Jesus says it. You shall love the Lord your God, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But what's amazing is that when you see Jesus expand this in Luke, he tells a story about a person, a Samaritan, who would not be the neighbor in the minds of anyone there. And it's the Samaritan who demonstrates the neighborly love that keeps the commandment and the culture of God. If you don't know the story, very quickly there was a Jewish man who was walking up to the city. And as he was, he was set upon by thieves and thugs. And they beat him and they take everything that they have and they leave him for dead. And two religious brethren of his walk down the street and they see him and they walk to the other side of the road and they leave him in his poor estate. Now they ought to have been the neighbors. They shared ethnic ties. They shared religious ties. They shared socioeconomic ties, it would seem. They shared political ties. And yet all of them walked by with no love. But the enemy the ethnic other, the religious other, the Samaritan, the political other, the one who worshipped in the wrong places and in the wrong ways, the other, the one who they thought of as less than. If you are into Harry Potter at all, as, as mudbloods, they spoke that degradingly about Samaritans. It was that one who stopped and who is a neighbor, which means for Jesus, your neighbor is any and everyone you might imagine. Earlier in Matthew, he says, you've heard, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I tell you, love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those who revile and despise you. Jesus has opened up what it means to be a neighbor to everyone. He is doing this in keeping the law. The Jewish law demanded that, that God's people be a society where the exile and where the, the, the refugee and where the foreigner was welcomed in and made one of their own. It demanded a society in which the poor were, were cared for and in which uh, every 50 years their needs and their debts were wiped out. The love of, of one another that, that shaped the culture of God's people. That love, it, we want it here within us, but we want it to be said that Vintage Durham loves its city and not the amenities of its city, not the coffee shops, not the, the breweries and, and tap rooms and, and all of the cool things that we do enjoy people of Durham, not just the people of Durham, the most vulnerable of Durham's citizens. We want to be marked as a church that steps out in love to them. It is in that moment that we will be keeping the spirit of the culture of the, kim of the kingdom of God. We love our neighbors and even we love our enemies. And that is so hard. 
It's the culture of the kingdom. And it's the culture of the kingdom because it's the call of the citizen of the kingdom. It's what you are called to. If you want to follow Jesus, if you are in this place where you're trying to figure out who Jesus is and is he worth following and what will it cost you, it will cost you all that love demands. The call of the citizen of the kingdom of God is love. I've said it before, this is my commandment that you love one another, that your joy may be full. They'll know you are my followers by your love. When, when, when Peter, or sorry, when Paul writes to the, the church in Corinth with all of their problems, with worldliness and with all of their problems just across the board, his command is not higher obedience. His instruction is love. If I, if, I, if I can speak with the tongues of angels, if I have special knowledge, if I have any of these things that we tend to value, power from heaven, uh, intellectual and, and, and theological rightness, if I have any of these things and I have not love, I have nothing. The call is love. You are called to love. What will it cost you to follow Jesus? It will cost you love. Jesus says this. He says there's greater love that no one has than this, that they lay down their lives for their friends. So when we say, oh, the call is love, and you're watering down the demands of God by simply calling us to love one another, it's because we have turned love into this emotional, weightless, costless thing that we just throw around at anyone. Love moves. Love acts. Love gives. Love dies. Jesus is not taking away the weight of the law. Jesus is compounding the scope of what it means to be called as God's citizens. Love will cost you everything, even your own life. It's the greatest, the first commandment, love God. And it is the second and most similar commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. As you do these things, you will be keeping and fulfilling the law and the prophets. It is the call of every one of us. You were not created for isolation. You were not created in order to be profitable. You were not created for productivity. You were created to flourish, and flourishing happens in community, and communal flourishing only happens with the presence of deep, rich, abiding, sacrificial love. When we look at the world, we see sometimes it seems that war may be necessary. I don't know. I've told you before, I'm a pacifist. These are conversations to be had. But sometimes it becomes clear that a person or a power must be stopped by any means necessary. But there is a reason that war never brings about lasting peace. War though it may do what needs to be done, never results ultimately in the flourishing of human people. It may result in the liberation of human people, and it may allow for their future flourishing, but it's not war that does that. It's a reframing of community around some semblance of some form of love. Love was the driving force behind the civil rights movement. I know we whitewash King, and we water down his political edge, and I'm not trying to do that. But all of those things were rooted in a deep, abiding love, first for the broken, oppressed, and vulnerable, and then for all people. Ooh, 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 ooh. 
Love brings about this flourishing. Love is the response to the fear that leads to so much contempt. Perfect love casts out fear. Over and over and over again, we see the scriptures calling us to deep, abiding love. It is the culture of the kingdom because it is the call of the citizen because it is the character of the king. If you want to know what God is like, if you say you know God and you have no love in you, you are a liar and you don't know him. Listen, God demonstrates his love in giving us Jesus. I love from the beginning of this that before he starts his ministry, Jesus is baptized and the word that God speaks over him is not, this is my savior boy that's about to do his work. This is my soldier who's about to defeat death. This is my promised Messiah who is about, right? Like, we get that in other points. This is the one, listen to him, Mount of Transfiguration, right? But in this moment, in that moment, what does God say of Jesus? This is my beloved son. He identifies Jesus as the beloved. Jesus will call his people beloved. We will call one another beloved. 1 John 4. Seven, eight, beloved, beloved, you are the beloved of God. I am the beloved of God. So much of our lives change when we can say this, and, and, and I think about Henry now and saying this to his friend, like what does it mean to, 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 to follow Jesus? It's to know that you are God's beloved, and so are they. To reach out as one's, who are loved and who love and who see the love of God on others. How we treat others would change so differently if we looked at them as beloved. Beloved, John says, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. But the one who doesn't love doesn't know God. Why? Because God is love. We can talk about the defining characteristics of God. His holiness. God is holy. That's a different type of statement than God is love. God is holy. That is an attribute. God is love. Not God is loving. God is love. The very quality of his nature is that of love. He's holy. He's holy other than us. He is love. Who doesn't love doesn't know God because God is love. It's the call of the citizen. It's who we are because it's who God is. God is love. God's love moves. God's love is creative. God's love is restorative. God's love is redemptive. God's love is active. God's love is self-sacrificing. And we walk in love because it's who God is. God loves you. Right here, right now, wherever you are in your life, whatever you're doing, whatever you're not doing, whatever you feel about yourself, whatever weight you're carrying, whatever arrogance or pride you're holding in your heart, right now you need to know that an underlying reality of all things is that God, the loving God who made everything, loves you. You are deeply loved by God. It's who he is. And his love has given himself up for you in Christ Jesus. It's his character. God is love. And therefore, we're called to love. And as we walk in that love, God is establishing a kingdom whose culture is love. What is the great and first commandment, teacher? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That's the first and great one. Second is of the same cloth. Love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So, in the last couple minutes that we have, 
how is it that we do that? Feels impossible, doesn't it? There's a theologian, uh, I think he might be retired, I'm not sure. He was at Yale. Uh, his name was Miroslav Volf. And he gave a speech on loving your enemy. Uh, and one of his mentors, Jurgen Moltmann, stood up after the speech, and of course everybody loved it, stood up after the speech in the question and answer section and said, yeah, you're actually a refugee. You're, you're the Serbian, Croatian, I don't know all the history of it, but he fled in that. How do you love the people who persecuted, killed, destroyed your people in your home, caused you to flee? The result of that was a book called Exclusion and Embrace, in which Wolf basically states that that even as we're excluded, we embrace. We love even our enemy. How do we do that, though? How do we do that? How do we love the other? How do we love the one who persecutes? How do we love the one who oppresses you? How do we love the one who binds you? How do we love your enemy? How do we love your competitor? How do we love? How is it that that happens? Because our hearts are human, and our inclinations are towards our own. And while there's a lot of work that has to go on, at a base, what we say, the Christian power for love comes in this, the gospel. Jesus, while we were enemies, loved us, came, died for us, called us his own, called us beloved. He lived a life that demonstrated perfect love to God and neighbor. He died out of love for those who weren't even, wouldn't even call ourselves his own. He was raised again in power over sin and death and brokenness so that we might be brought in as beloved children and heirs with him. And he has given us every good thing in God, which means that, which means that you have no fear of death. Like it may cause anxiety, but ultimately it's toothless. There is life. You have no fear of want because you have a perfect, loving, heavenly Father who will give you everything you need even though it may feel different at times. You have no fear of acceptance. Because though the world, or even sometimes those who call themselves God's church, may reject and expel you, may, may keep you at a distance, the Lord God has brought you in by his love. And you will have no need for love because the fullness of the riches and the goodness of God in Christ Jesus are yours. Therefore, you have nothing that can be taken from you that God has not given and will not restore in abundance. Therefore, you are free to risk it all to love. It is only when you know that your life is hidden with Christ and God that you can love people unto death. It's only when you know that God is redeeming and restoring all things that you can love people in, in, in the fullness of, of godly justice. It's only when you know that there's no thing that you have that does not belong to God that you are free to love even your enemies with all that you possess. The gospel frees us to love. That is what it is to be a citizen of God, of God's kingdom. Free. Freed from sin, yes. But freed from the cares and the burdens of any of the structures and systems of this world. And free then to love. It's who we are. It's what we do. 
It's the culture, at least it ought to be, to which we belong. Let's love one another. Let's pray. Jesus, the truth is, and you know this, that if we ask whether or not the church is marked by love, the response rate on that varies greatly. But you've called us to it. We can't love perfectly because we're not perfect, but we can pursue it with all that we have. So would you make us a people of love? Would we love one another well? Would we love our community, our neighborhood, our city? God, would we even love our enemies so that they all might see your love displayed in your people. And they might know and hear the call that they too are the beloved of God as they walk and rest and hope in Christ Jesus. For his glory, for the good of our neighbors, we pray. Amen. Each week we hear the gospel we rehearse it together, we're reminded of it, and then we respond in song. We respond at the table. Worship is an act of love. So let's stand now, if you can, and let's sing to the God who loves us.
Lord. Um, I don't know how to work these things. <laughs> there we go. Got it. It's like one screw. Um, I was thinking about what Sean was preaching today, uh, and so much richness, so much good, good to to take to walk away from. But um, just I wrote it on my hand. Uh, the culture of the kingdom is love. Uh, just I don't have anything profound to say, just other than uh, that really sunk in for me this morning. And I was thinking about him speaking to these Pharisees, these Sadducees, and it was like he was demonstrating that even to them, even to his enemies. He was giving them another opportunity to, to see what was right before them, that this kingdom had something far greater than what they were um, could even imagine and were pursuing. And that that hate that they had been building towards him and building this case against him, he met them in that moment with love and said, this is the greatest commandment. And I feel like he did that same thing with the disciples in the upper room that night before he was betrayed. Um, he demonstrated the greatest, the greatest love and he, he took that bread and he broke it um, as a demonstration of his body that was going to be broken. And he took the cup and he also, um, he, he, he said to them that this was going to be his blood, a new covenant in his blood that would be poured out for them. And again, invited them into this demonstration. He's showing them what the greatest love, and even after he did it, they didn't quite get it until later when he was risen and they could fully understand what that meant. And so um, if you have one of these cups, I just invite you to kind of put yourself there and remember um, with us that his body was broken for you, church. Whatever you're going through, he knows, and he suffered. Um, so do this in remembrance of him. And church, his blood was shed for you. Let's do this to remember him. Let's continue to sing.
Amen. Well, before we go, uh, Isaiah 40 tells us that the Lord gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. And uh, we, are, we want to make sure as a people that you know that uh, we are here to pray for you. If you need prayer, if you're finding yourself in a place of uh, weakness or weariness, if you're in need of healing or the Lord's anointing this morning, if you have anything you need to be covered in prayer, uh, let us know. We'd invite you to stay here at the close of the service. Just stay in your seats and, and one of our leaders will come and find you and pray for you. Uh, share your burdens with one another in so much as you can. I know some of them are, are heavy and, and personal, but even still, without fully knowing, we want to to pray for you. Um, but with that being said, uh, people of God, let us live out of the freedom Christ gives us by his sacrifice on the cross. May he empower us by his Holy Spirit to love our neighbors well and to proclaim his gospel message to the glory of his great name. Now I'd ask you to just hold out your hands and and receive this benediction. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we think or ask according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.